Hey guys, Solomon here. Hope you're having a great day today. We're going to be looking at round five in my recent uh, tournament uh, over Memorial Day weekend and, uh, you know, playing six games and then all six games, you know me, I played the hippopotamus defense. Here is white in game five. I started this thing off against Rianne, a strong 2000 player with the move B3. Right, net of six. I now play G3. By the way, with the hippo, there's so many different move orders that you can start with. Um, I recently been playing B3 to start with white, and uh, here I played the move G3 because I didn't, you know, I didn't want to play a move like Bishop B2 and risk Black Fee and shadowing their bishop and just preventing me from playing the hippo. Right, I got to play G3 so that if B6, I can play this move and get both of my bishops being shadowed. Right, of course, if Black did play B6 move one, which has happened to be before, it's not the end of the world at all. Oftentimes, you still can get your hippo set up, especially with them advancing in the center. Um, but okay, I mean, you know, obviously, if we can't get our full hippo. We can just play, you know, we can just play chess from that point. But nearly every game I play um, up to this point, I do get that hippo. So, okay, G6, you know what we're doing here, right? Double fianchetto, put our pawns in the center. Um, we're looking to tuck those knights and, and really put six of our pawns on the third rank from white, right? Move 10, we got our full thick skinned hippo, and now we're ready to roll. Black here uh, plays the move of A5, and I actually just castle kingside. I do this for a couple of reasons. First off, you know, I, I oftentimes keep my king in the center for a while, but in this case, I mean, I, I, you know, I don't want to castle queenside. I'm just being honest. I don't want to castle queenside because it seems like black is not far away from just launching an absolute, absolutely brutal pawn storm on my king. Whereas on the king's side, I'm, I'm not, I'm not so concerned, right? I'm just not, right? As, uh, as opposed to a move like a five with, with you know, black, you know, having ideas of, of just absolutely trying to break that side open. So, I end up castling kingside. That's one reason. The second reason is because I am looking to play f four at some point right potentially and i want this rook to support that pawn okay now here in this position uh Rian took quite a bit of time trying to figure out what to do we see this move of knight a6 i play rook a2 what am i doing i'm kind of just keeping in my little hippo zone right i i, I have i'm only taking up three ranks i'm staying in my little bubble and i'm also looking to play queen a1 uh you know potentially right forming a battery ram along this diagonal putting pressure on e5 notice here e5 is a bigger target than the square or the pawn of d5 why is that well d5 is defended twice right so is e5 but d5 is defended by a pawn e5 is not right so you know it really depends what is defending a pawn and ironically whatever you know like a pawn here since it's defended by another you know pawn which is not worth much material it's actually a stronger defender than you know a rook and a queen right because if we start exchanging stuff off in this case i'm getting a rook i'm getting a queen if we take you know on d5 the first capture is going to be with a pawn right so you know i'm, I'm looking at rook a2 i'm looking at queen a1 i'm looking at f4 here Ian, uh takes you know more time and play c5 and you know i keep harping on this okay I'm, a, I'm i'm gonna keep harping on it okay by playing the hippo one of the biggest advantages that you get right is that you get a big time advantage most games okay in this tournament i can't tell you how many times i was up 10 20 30 minutes in this game i think i was around you know up around 40 minutes at one point uh, because you know my opponent was trying to figure out what to do and part of that is because the hippo is so rare right no one plays it right it's very rare well, i shouldn't say nobody but you know a lot of people don't so it's rare and it is hard to play against it's not simple it is not simple to break the hippo wall c5 is played now in this case we have a three pawn center and whenever i do see a three pawn center like this i like to attack the outside of it right towards the center of the board so in this case i like to play f4 if we have this kind of center i like to play the move of c4 and just kind of try to break that center up All right i play this move f4 notice here uh black could take on f4 but now i take back with the knight right this bishop is, is super active this rook is active this queen could also start to double up right so that's dangerous and uh you may be wondering okay what if black just takes the pawn well in that case we just take this knight right the defender of d5 we capture here we're attacking a queen bishop and rook and white here should be feeling pretty good right so going back to f4 uh, we do not see black take, which I, I think gives white a great game. We instead see the move of d4. There, there's, there's different options that I could have played here. I could have just played e4 right away. I actually went with uh, taking on e5 and then playing the move of e4, just trying to create an imbalance here. Uh, you know, whole idea being that, you know, without these pawns here, uh, you know, there, there is an imbalance in terms of the pawn center. I have two central pawns, aka on the, 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 the d and e files. Uh, black, on the other hand, only has one, right? They, they have the pawn on d4. So, 
Um, yeah, I mean, you know, in this case, uh, there, there's a lot of potential moves that I have available. Uh, one of them is, you know, even bringing this bishop back to c1, right? You've spent all this time locking down my bishop. Okay, I'm just going to come right back, which happens uh, just a few moves later. Bishop e6 was playing the game, and I actually took quite a bit of time here. I was trying to figure out what to do. I was looking at this move of c3, which the computer actually likes, uh, you know, just kind of slowly advancing, trying to grind down on that, that d4 pawn. Um, but overall, I was looking at different lines, but I was I was just worried about, at the end of the day, that this pawn was backwards, right? I, you know, I suppose you can move it uh, because there's only one pawn attacking, but I just, I didn't feel great from a practical perspective about both of these pawns being being weak, right? There's, there's no longer a pawn on C2, so I was definitely a little bit concerned about that. So instead of giving up my C2 pawn, which is so, you know, important to defending D3 and B3, which, by the way, is important to defending E4, right? The, the, the base of the pawn chain is the most important, and that's the one that you really got to watch out for. So, you know, C3 totally works, but I ended up just playing out of three and knight f4. I said, you know, in my head, I'm like, okay, I mean, these aren't bad moves, right? They're just, they're just, you know, solid moves, getting the knights better. I play bishop c1. Notice by, by going on this diagonal, bishop h6 does not work because I take on e6 attacking the queen, and the second you take back, I win your bishop, right? So, the, so this bishop can't move, right? Can't come to h6. My bishop now owns this diagonal. Uh, in the game, we have the move of knight b8. Right, so here black kind of, you know, they played here. Now they go back. This happens all the time in the hippo as well. Your opponent will commit to some kind of move, and then they see the hippo, and then they got to kind of kind of rearrange, right? So sometimes against the hippo, someone might not exactly have a thorough plan, whereas with the hippo, you know exactly what you're doing because you've seen this position hundreds, if not thousands of times. Uh, here I play the move knight g5, just, you know, trying to activate my knights, uh, put some pressure on e6. We have the move of knight c6. And I, and I end up taking with my f knight and playing bishop f4, attacking the queen. Now, here I was actually expecting the move of e5 or knight e5. I was looking at both of these moves. Um, and, you know, I think both of them are solid. Both of them give give black, you know, pretty much just a dead even game here. Um, you know, you could argue maybe even black has a slight advantage there. Although I think it's just pretty much about dead even. Um, but so we see the move of queen e7. This surprised me, but still dead even in terms of the evaluation. I now play the move e5, right? And I play it pretty quickly. Uh, here at this point in the game, uh, Rianne was, you know, uh, much more down on time than I was. Again, at one point I had like a 40 minute advantage, um, you know, so I'm trying to put the pressure on black here, right? We got to hit those 40 moves, right? Before you get that sudden death 30. So um, I play e5. Notice here, black has a big decision to make, and that is what the heck they're going to do with their knight. What are you going to do? If you play a move like knight h5, uh, that knight, it's not the best. Right, we could take on c6, play a move like knight e4. Notice this this pawn on e5 is doing a lot of work. You take on f4, we take back with the g pawn to reinforce that central pawn. And I just felt like you know, in addition to black's terrible pawn structure, uh, white has a lot to play for here. Right, we have a lot to play for. Not you know, it's not like we're winning in two moves, but okay, I'm, I'm definitely taking white here over black any day of the week. Right, going back to the move e5. What if you play a move like knight d7? Well, in this case, there's there's multiple things we could do, including knight f7. Knight f7. Right? Attacking this rook. Okay? Um, you know, if, if you move the rook to c8, we can even just play knight d6 and fork, right? If you take the knight with the king, right? Notice here, if you take with the king, bishop g5 with check, we're going to win the queen unless you give up a bishop or something like that, right? And this is... This is this is hard. This is hard for you know for black to deal with. And if you take with the queen, we are still going to go with bishop g5 attacking the queen. Right? This queen's trapped in the, in the sense that the queen can't just run away. You know, no matter where this queen moves, it's going to get lost. Right? No matter where it goes. So, you know, if black does try to save that queen with something like knight f6, we just take it off the board. Um, and I felt pretty good in a position like this with such a strong uh, f6 pawn. And a bishop here that at any moment can can just kind of mess up that that pawn structure. Uh, I don't think the computer likes this move, um, but at some point I probably would have played this. I just yeah, I just feel like that's really hard for Black to deal with. So uh, so going back, I play e5. Neither of these moves are very good, right? And obviously both of these just lose the knight right away. Uh, so we see this move knight e5. I got to be honest, okay? I, when I played e5, I was planning to just take this knight, right? Take this knight. Uh, you know, and if e takes d5, play e6. But then I realized if I take the rook captures and and e5 is, you know, it's not great, right? It's 
you know, it's, it's, it's hard. It's hard to deal with that. Now, even then, the computer still actually thinks that, that black's completely fine here. Um, and now that I look at it, it's like, okay, that, that, that looks pretty, but black's fine. Black's fine. They can play a move like, like Rook A8, apparently. That's what the computer recommends. I'm, I'm looking more at, more at something like H6, right? Uh, okay, we play Knight 7 You play Rook there. We, we could check. That's fine. Um, but this this pawn's just not going to last forever. You can play. You're not. You don't even have to be in a rush to take it. You can take it right away. Whatever you do, this is not a clear win for White. Right. Right. So you know it, it, it's tough. There, there's still quite a bit of game ahead of us. Um, but yeah, I mean, all that to say, when I did see knight d5, I realized that oh my gosh, if I take, you know, at the time I'm thinking rook takes d5, e5 is you know one, two, three, all of these pieces. Um, just absolutely hunkering down on that e5 on the e5 pawn. So when I did see knight t5, I was going, oh my gosh, did I just freaking lose the game, right? I just gave up c3, right? Did I just give up e3? That kind of thing. But then I realized that I have this move of knight e4, right? Centralizing my knight and really looking at these dark squares while protecting the square of c3. Now there's some there's some things that that black could have done here um, in this instance, right? Uh, you know, 94. Uh, in fact, the computer actually likes black just playing a move like knight takes e5. Okay, now now what does this give up? It does give up bishop g5, which actually is going to give us some material, but this game is far from over. Two centralized knights, a knight looking at e3. This is getting scary for white, right? This is hard. This is hard. In fact, part of me kind of wishes I was black if I was in this position, right? Um, but but here we see the move of knight e3, and this is kind of when things started to go south for black. In that case, I take, and I play knight f6 to check. Right, knight f6 to check. At the time, I'm thinking, okay, I mean, if Ryan takes on f6, I take back with the e-pawn. You know, I mean, you got to block. If you don't, I'm going to play f7 with check, a fork, supported by the rook. You got to play queen f7. And when you do, I can take on c6, play queen f3. Even material, but black here, double isolated pawns, another set of double isolated pawns, an isolated pawn on a5. Uh, we have, you know, a very strong pass pawn on f6. I'm just, you know, from a practical standpoint, it's going to be hard for black to hang on here, right? But she plays the move of king h8. And I realize here that if I take on e8, black can do that. They can take on e5. I'm currently up four points of material, but then my knight would be trapped. My knight's going to get lost. Right, and I could take on c6. That's fine. I could play queen e1, trying to guard that pawn. But but then I play. Then then the knight falls, and I'm only up one point material. Right, I'm down a pawn, up the exchange. Uh, my rook can't move. Right, uh, you know g3 is under fire. There's pretty easy moves here for black that that seem natural, and I can't even take this pawn because I get pinned. So that did not look very fun to me. Just being honest, right? So I didn't take the rook. I actually took on c6. And then played queen f3. Just tried to support this knight as much as I can. Rook f8 was played. Uh, I ended up taking on e3. Uh, here, uh, Rian ended up taking on f6. I played queen e5. And this is really the last chance that Rian had uh, to get a draw. At this point, she's very low on time. The move here is actually rook f8. You got to play rook f8 because now you have two defenders on that rook, right? And if, if I play c4 trying to get more attackers on it, there's two things you can do. One of them is just get the king out of the pin, just get the king the heck out of the pin, or throw the queen in the middle, right? King here is a little bit more accurate, but this works as well. However, in the game, king here was played, and now I play c4, black's in a world of trouble. Because I have a pin here, and black cannot get out of it in the same way. If you play king f7, I take on f6, bring the rook over, queen versus rook end game, easy money, right? Here we see the move h6. I pile up, right? I have three attackers. You have two defenders, so you got to put a third one on there. So in this situation, we got we got three defenders, we got three attackers, right, on this rook. I'm now, I'm now trying to think, how can I break this position open and put more attackers on it? I play this move of h4, okay, just gaining space. h5 is played. I played g4. What is the idea here? Well, in the game, Rianne takes the pawn, but let's say black doesn't take the pawn. There's two other things black can do. One of them is to just kind of move a piece, and one of them is to run away with the king. Let's say the king runs away, right? No matter where this king moves, whether it's there, 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 I don't really care. Um, I guess if you went there, I could throw in a check too, but all that to say, no matter where this king goes, if you move here, this rook just lost a defender. If you move there, the rook still lost a defender. I'm taking here. I mean, this is just a wipeout, 
right? G4 is played. What if black doesn't run away with the king, but they just make a move? Well, then I have G5, right? Now I have one, two, three, four attacking pieces. You only have three defending. If four attackers versus three defenders, the attackers are going to win. You always got to have a plus one when, when you're the one initiating the trade. All right, so going back to G4, here we have H takes. I play H5. Again, you know, uh, black here did not take uh, this pawn, but let's just say that black did. What's the idea here? Well, we have queen g5 with check, forcing the king to run away and stop defending this rook, right? Or play here and we just take. Okay, so if you play king h7, we just take. We're absolutely winning, right? So going back to h5, taking does not work. Uh, by the way, one more thing. If check, you, you can play here, but then I just won the queen, right? So you play here, win the queen, play anywhere else, I just take the rook. We're winning, right? h5 is played here. Black did not take but then I play h6, distracting this king, right? Making this king move off of its perfect square. Again, you move here. Thank you for the rook because this rook no longer defends. Um, and if you take, which is what happens in the game, we win the rook. Uh, the game continued here with taking. I, I threw in a check, took the pawn, queen f3, offered a trade. And here, here black resigned because, I mean, if you trade, I'm just up a rook, right? A, a rook versus for a few pawns. And, and I mean, if you look at these pawns, they, they ain't going nowhere, right? Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, on top of that, we have all these check ideas. In fact, if, if you take the pawn on c4, for example, we just have a mate in two, right? So going back, queen f3 is where uh, the game ended, right? All I'd say, hope that you enjoyed uh, this hippo video. At this point in the tournament, I am three out of five uh, with the hippo. Ended up winning game one against the 2500, losing two, bounced back by winning two. And uh, yeah, tomorrow we're going to wrap this series up going over game six. Um, as I played with the black pieces, one last hippo game. And, uh, yeah, that is where this tournament will conclude. Hope to see y'all tomorrow. Uh, I think this, the game tomorrow was my highest, um, accuracy game, 93%. So I hope you tune in and I hope that you learned something from it. Hey, thanks for watching today's video. I hope you enjoyed it. Wanted to give a big shout out to my Patreon supporters for the month of June in 2023 if you haven't checked out the patreon before uh go make sure to check it out we'd love to have you join the family and we are continuing to add more and more benefits um, that you get right by becoming a member as always thanks for watching this video and i hope to see you in the next one